This is a production of Cornell University. Um, now, if I did this the wrong way, you might say I did because I listened to Frank Rossi when I said I was giving this seminar, and Frank said, kind of, you know, not a lot of data, you know, put a, put a few jokes in there. So I'm following his advice. So if it goes awry, don't blame me, blame him. Um, basically, what I was going to do is really just give a good overview of the types of data that go into climate research. And in working with Dave and a number of people here at Allen, you know, that, that always comes up. Where are we getting this data from? You know, the, the observed data, the data from the past, the current data that we use, and then more importantly as we move on to it, the data we're going to use in the future. So that's kind of a little bit of background um, about my slide. And then just kind of going over the contents, um, really here the, the the middle part is going to be kind of short changed, but the, the first part and the last part are, is where I'm going to focus most of my effort. And I'm focusing on the first part in this kind of intriguing bullet here, climate gate. Did anyone know the whole scandal of emails in the research lab in East Anglia and things like that? Yeah. I'm going to try to shed a little bit of light on that. And really the, the bottom line in all of that is, you know, climate data have been collected for a number of years, hundreds of years, hundred years at least. Um, but never with the intent of monitoring climate change. So it's basically a data set that's out there, it's been used for other purposes, had its roots pretty much in agriculture, and it's only now recently that we've been using these data to, to uh, monitor climate change. And that has some implications to it, and, and hopefully I'll, I'll bring that out in some of my talk. And then really in the end, what we have to boil down to is we're trying to project these climate parameters into the future, 100 years into the future. How can we go about doing that and more importantly, how can we do, go about doing that at the scale that is just right? Most of the models we operate on are these big global um, climate models that have kind of one observation for an area about the size of New York, but yet we're interested in can we, will we be able to grow grapes in the Finger Lakes um, in 2100, or will this crop do well in New York, and so forth and so on. So there it's a matter of getting the size just right. <coughs> Really the whole backbone of the climate network, observed climate network in the United States is something that's called the Historical Climatology Network. And I'm going to use the U.S. as an example, but this is a good example for pretty much anywhere else in the world where there is an extensive set of observed meteorological data going back 100 years. So most of Europe, same thing in China and Russia. Really, these types of issues and things are things that come up in all of them. For the U.S., there are approximately a little over a thousand stations in this network to cover the size of the U.S. Um, the resolution of these data is primarily daily, so not hourly data, things like that, daily. And really, it's measuring three things. The daily maximum temperature, the daily minimum temperature, and how much rainfall, the daily precipitation. So that's really the 100-year record we're really confined <coughs> to these measurements. Um, Many stations, almost all of them have 50-year records, some have more than 100 years records, and like I said before, never intended to really track climate change. And kind of to, just to put this into perspective, um, you know, the, the historical climate network is pretty much the cream of the cream of these stations. If we look at any old station, there's about today, about 6,000, 8,000, somewhere in there, depending on where we are, stations that actually re record these observations. If I use a rain gauge as an example, if I took every rain gauge that was operational in the United States today and put them rim to rim, okay, anyone want to venture a guess how big of an area that would cover? Go ahead, Tom. Rhode Island. <laughs> no, not Rhode Island. Anyone want to better soccer? Square miles. Neil is closer. A tennis court. Okay. So we take every rain gauge in the U.S., put them rim to rim, we got a tennis court. So that kind of gives you an idea of what we're dealing with here to measure climate change or anything on a national scale. There's the dis distribution of these stations. Pretty much have good coverage <coughs> across the country, kind of sparse in some of the areas you would expect them to be sparse, but overall a pretty good coverage. This is what a typical state, this is kind of what a typical station looks like. This is the Game Farm Road station. And really uh, a few extra instruments here. But the main ones are this rain gauge here with a windshield around it and two temperature sensors. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later. The primary sensor is this one right here, which is called the max-min temperature sensor. Um, the one thing about 
the U.S. Historical Climate Network is it's citizen science in action. It's been citizen science forever. These things are pretty much in people's backyards. Okay, so this is an example of a station, I don't know which one it is, um, in the Historical Climate Network. The rain gauge is out of the, the, the frame, but here's the MMTS. The network also expands to some um, airport stations, so here's the temperature center at Binghamton, which is part of this. But for the most part, these are volunteer networks. The weather service is supplying the instrumentation, but the volunteer is supplying the manpower. Um, there are some bad apples, and this is really the crux of climate change. So here's an example of an MMTS that's kind of in some bushes and right by a big asphalt parking lot. Not the best exposure for measuring temperature. Here's an even worse exposure for measuring temperature. That's a burn barrel. Uh, I don't know what the mob looks like on the name of the side from the garbage. Um, and there's a fair number of these, again, a really bad exposure here. This is the temperature sensor up there. So, I mean, you don't need to be a climatologist to figure out that these are not good locations for measuring temperature. Um, however, these few bad apples, I mean, these are just the bad examples that I've picked out here. What I want to say is they don't spoil the bunch. So if we actually go out and look at these stations, okay, and it was kind of, it's kind of, you know, the, the, the sad part about it is when these stations were selected to be in the U.S. Climate Network, probably about 30 years ago, 20 years ago, nobody went out and looked at them. They looked at the length of record, they looked at the amount of missing data, they never looked at the sites. So that's why these bad apples are, are in the bunch. But when we look at this, basically the blue line is a temperature trend over the last huh, 50 or so years from the good stations, the best stations, the cream of the crops, the Ithacas, the, the, the stations that are in nice pristine environments. The red line is all of the stations. So if we take all of the stations, the bad apples and all, and what we can see is that really those few bad apples make some difference in the exact numbers, but overall if we're looking at the trend, we have the same pretty much magnitude and pattern of trend through time. Okay. So when these scientists from East Anglia were criticized for taking some data out of their analyses, what they were actually doing was separating out the bad apples that occur not only here, but across the globe. I could have picked examples of stations like this from any country. Again, they are, the, they are the exceptions rather than the rule. The data are processed in a number of different ways, and they're processed to remove non-climatic things that creep into them. So pretty much the easiest things are things like quality control and missing data and urbanization. Basically here, a very simple adjustment on the raw data to adjust for population. So something like a growing city where population is changing, gets adjusted. That warming due to urbanization is removed from the data. And again, quality control is really uh, my Walgreens sign. It's not 501. So things like that. And I mean, this is probably a common error. Keep it in mind, up until very recently, these things were keyed in from paper form. So the observer went out to the station, wrote down a number, sent in his form or her form at the end of the month, and somebody digitized these. So it's very easy that, you know, 50.1 got keyed in as 50 or 501. The stations are adjusted for relocations. Um, this is the current Ithaca station. This is the Ithaca station in 1930. That is the temperature shelter. Anyone know what building that is? Robert's That's Robert's. Roberts Hall. So the roof of Roberts Hall was the official observation site in the 1930s. A um, bunch of other stuff up here. Was it really warm back then? I mean, it was, lot, if you look at the Ithaca record, the record highs in Ithaca are in the 1930s. Why? It's a black roof on the top of Robert's Hall. Okay? A lot, lot different here. We're about at the same level now. So kind of, if you want to fact, you know, think of climate change that way, the roof of Roberts Hall and Game Farm Road are about even. Actually, back here, Ithaca was an official weather service station. There was a weather bureau office in Roberts Hall. And just as a, this thing up here is actually the signal flag. So they, they throw up a flag, you know, you see a hurricane flag or something like that flying. There used to be one of those on the roof of Roberts Hall. Um, the data are adjusted for a change in instrumentation. Basically, prior to the mid-1980s, the temperatures were taken by a maximum and minimum thermometer, liquid and glass, enclosed in the Stevenson screen. 
in the mid-1980s, most of the stations, not all of them, <coughs> moved on to an electric sensor here, which is a thermal couple inside the MMTS. So these are the two, basically, for the last 100 years, these are the only two types of instruments that we use. The data are also adjusted for observation time. These are once-a-day observations of maximum and minimum temperature taken by volunteers. So I'm an early riser, and it's, for me, it might be easier to take my observation in the morning before I come into work. So if I were doing that, and this is my example of a morning observation, if I was coming in and, and say I took my observation at 7 a.m., okay, so if I took my observation at 7 a.m. on this morning, I would be looking at the lowest temperature in this 24-hour period, and it just so happened to occur right when I took the observation. Okay, so this value is a little bit colder than that value. So that's my min. I reset my thermometer, can only go to the minimum temperature, I can't make it any more colder or any more warmer. Then I come back the next day, and throughout this whole period the temperature has risen. Okay, so when I take my observation here, say what was the minimum temperature in the last 24 hours? It was over here. Okay, so when I take my observations in the morning, I tend to count a particularly cold morning twice. If I'm the opposite and rather do it when I come home from work, I have the opposite problem. I now take my observation at the time of day, and whoops, looks like Mac and PC got messed up. These were supposedly lined up. I take my observation at the time when the temperature is the warmest. So if I came and I looked at this period of time, this would be my max, not that. And then if I came the next day at 5 p.m., I would be counting that max twice. So the same type of thing, but, but in the afternoon. So the morning observers tend to have a cold bias. The afternoon observers tend to have a warm bias. And this wouldn't be a problem if observers were random. But there has been a systematic shift through time to take morning observations. So there's been an artificial cooling in the climate record due to that. But really, this adjustment is pretty easy to figure out, and it, it's a pretty robust adjustment knowing what the observation time was. So let's look at this. This is some trends in the HCN. Um, but basically, how does, what is the difference as we add each of these adjustments? So the green line is just if we fill in missing data and it's, it's nothing really there to write home about. The red line is the instrument adjustment. So this is when we shifted from a cotton region shelter to an MMTS in the mid-80s. And as you can see, that, that caused a very slight warm bias to the record. The record warmed. Or our adjustment had to be toward warming said that backwards. The bias is actually cooling, and this is the adjustment that we need to do. If we look at the change in observation time, again, a systematic shift to morning observations is a cooling, so our adjustment, we have to add warming to the record. And there you can see the magnitude of this is on the order of, um, in degrees F, unfortunately, but about a third of a degree Fahrenheit. <coughs> the station moves, again, the adjustment is towards warming. And the reason for this is through time, there's been a systematic shift in having stations in the center of a city and then moving them out to an airport location. So Baltimore might be a good example where the station used to be in the courthouse in the center of Baltimore and it got moved out to the airport. Okay, That, in this case, that's a big enough move that it counts as two stations, but that gives you the general flavor of these moves. So there's a, there's a, a cooling, or actually the Ithaca example is a good example of that. Another systematic shift was from rooftop locations to ground locations. So there again, a cooling in the record that has to be adjusted. Um, urbanization, of course, has the opposite effect. And here, this population adjustment is about a tenth of a degree Fahrenheit. So really, the biggest, the biggest difference there is the observation time and the station moves, which together are about a half a degree Fahrenheit. Um, Chris? I don't quite understand. If you have a maximum minimum thermometer, either automatic or one that you can read the minimum temperature on, it doesn't matter when the temperature is taken, is it? Um, so what's this bias thing? I don't quite It, it yeah. does because they're not electronic thermometers like a data logger where you know what everything is at every hour or every minute of the day. So basically, the best analogy I can give to the, 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 the liquid and glass thermometers, and they continue that in the electronic thermometers, it's like a fever thermometer. So you know, you take your temperature with a fever thermometer, if it's 103, it's, you know, you pull it out of your mouth, it's 103, and it stays at 103 until you shake it down. Okay, so these thermometers work exactly the same way. It records the highest temperature 
that has been recorded since you have reset it. Nothing in between. Does that make sense? Yeah, but then why wouldn't you go to something more automatic where you would know the exact temperature at a particular moment in time? It doesn't matter when you read it. All right, and, and the, the whole reason there is, is primarily the federal government is broke and, and devoid on technology or they're working on antiquated technology. But the other reason, too, is you have this big, long record, you know, a hundred-year record of doing it one way. The current technology of electronic thermometers, when the observer goes out to Game Farm Road, there is a readout that basically says what was the highest temperature that was recorded in the last 24 hours and what was the coolest, and that's it. Okay. There have been moves, and we'll see, to get away from that in, in the today. This, keep in mind, this is my, um, I forget what it was, times past. Um, the other thing is the U.S. temperature record from measurements like this very much mirrors the, national, uh, the global record. So if we see the U.S. record, kind of a flat period in through the 40s, uh, excuse me, a rise from the 1900s to about the 1940s, a decrease to about the 1970s, an increase. We see the same type of thing. I have a different scale here, but here's my rise from the 1900s to about 1940, my kind of decrease or flat period in through the 70s, and then my rise. So really, the U.S. record is a good match to the global record in looking at these observed temperatures. All right, the present. Finally, last five years or so, the NOAA said, hey, we need to do something to really monitor climate change. We need a network that really does this. And they've instituted what is called the, the Climatological Reference Network. This is about 100 stations across the U.S., given by the uh, yellow dots, one up here in Canada. The layout of these dots was done very scientifically. We were involved in some of the work to say, what is the minimum stations we can put out in the U.S. to get a good measure of what the temperature trend has been? Okay, so a lot of actually the siting of these stations, the spacing between these stations is scientifically based. Um, a CRN station looks like that. Those are the two in New York. There's one out at the uh, Animal Science Facility in Hartford, and there's one down at Millbrook. Okay? Um, actually, the, the Climate Center was involved in siting these stations, and it was a real bear, particularly in the Northeast. Because one of the requirements of these stations, and there was a whole review process, is that the area around the station could not be expected to change for 50 years. So we wanted to have Game Farm Road be one of these stations. But when we went, you know, one of the review processes was look at, okay, what is Cornell's plans for expansion? That's the way they planned on expanding, so that automatically nixed that. So we were able to do that out in Hartford. And this was really hard in the Northeast because, number one, it couldn't be on private land. It always had to be on public land. So we actually had a nice facility out, anybody by the benchmark at George Jr. I thought that would be a great location for a site, but... George Jr. isn't private land, it's public, I mean, it's, it's privately held land, so that, that got nicked. So really hard, especially in the Northeast, uh, to site these stations. But anyway, rain gauge in there, electronic sensors there, there's actually three redundant sensors all looking at the same thing, actually within this, um, measuring solar radiation, measuring wind, there are some things to see if things are out of whack between the sensors. So they really did this upright to really monitor climate. And this is like five minute data, Chris, so now we don't have this problem. Um, and really, increasingly, a lot of the Indian. So, locally, do they try to avoid lake effect sites? Um, the criteria for citing these, yes, they did, basically. They, they, you know, a lot of argument of where you put something along the coast. Right. Um, but as, as long as the coast reflected that trend in the temperature or needed to, to, you know, those stations were looked at and how much did that affect the U.S. trend, there was some sighting there. But most of them are actually been away from large bodies of water, that was the criteria. Um, you know, increasingly now our observations globally, U.S. are coming from remotely sensed platform. So we have a nice satellite record going back from the end of the 70s. And really what I'm trying to show here is the blue is surface observations and a number of different satellite platforms. And here the trends, if you can make them out, are a little bit different. The, the slope is different, but yet the same type of an increase. And just because they're satellites, these same types of problems that creep into station data 
also creep in the satellite. The satellite orbits degrade through time, and that has to be adjusted for. Um, you know, changes in atmospheric moisture might affect the satellite record. So just because it's coming from a satellite doesn't mean it's devoid of these types of, of, of things that, that go on at the surface. And increasingly for, for rainfall, um, radar is becoming a platform for looking at this. Um, also, a lot of our information, and this is really kind of my transition in going from global circulation models to observations. A lot of our observations is we use a data set that's called the reanalysis. And the best way to describe a reanalysis is it takes all kinds, basically data from any number of platforms, radiosons, weather balloons, uh, aircraft, surface observations, satellite, how clouds are moving to get an idea of the wind. And these are the data that go into um, initializing weather forecast models. Right? So if I have a gridded model to predict tomorrow's weather, I need to give it its initial conditions. And these are the types of data that go into that. Okay? So what has been done is going back uh, 30 or even in some cases 50 years to take the observations that go into initializing these forecasts put them through a standardized routine so the routine doesn't change through time. Okay? And then come up with a gridded data set that blends all of these platforms together. So it's giving me things like precipitation, it's giving me things like surface temperature, but it's also giving me things like wind speed and pressures and heights and where the highs and lows are. Okay? Much like a global circulation model does. So this reanalysis data set sort of is going to, or it does provide a benchmark to global circulation models. And I'll show that in some of my later slides. Um, all right, so the future. Um, so really, what is a climate model? Getting to the, the, to the title of my talk, you know, I, if I can't get the weather right tomorrow, how do I get the climate right in 100 years? So really, in a climate model, we have to take this whole big climate system, the atmosphere, the sun, the volcanoes, the oceans, the ice, the greenhouse gases, the clouds, you know, the agriculture and the land surface, and basically turn that into a model. So even though that's a nice picture, oops, in my end, there it comes. You know, basically I'm taking all of that and turning it into a lot of computer code. Okay, so basically that is the, the crux of the climate model. I'm not, we're not going to go through a couple of equations, but not too many. Um, Because I think, again, it's just an analogy I was trying to think. I think anybody can say, you know, if I turn on the lava lamp, what's going to happen to the lava? It's going to rise in the lamp. Okay, so that's the basic physics of what's going on. I'm heating the lava from, from the bottom and it's rising. Okay. But if I asked a different question, you know, how big is each blob of lava as it rises? You know, or predict you know, when this guy rises, the next one rises, how big is it going to be? Nobody's going to know. That's more like the weather. Or an example I usually do, I don't have it, if I dropped a piece of paper. Okay? If, I asked you what was, if I asked you to model what was going to happen to the paper if I let go, you'd all say it's going to fall to the floor. Right? That's cool. That's the climate. Okay? If I asked you where it was going to land, every time I drop it, it's going to land someplace different, and that's just the, the chaos, and then it's going to be somewhere it's different, and nobody's going to be able to do that. That's the web. So again, here in the climate, my example is, yes, we're looking at if we add greenhouse gases, what is the overall trend going to do? But really what we don't expect the model to get are these interannual variations. The model doesn't know, you know, the model might replicate El Nino, but the model has no idea in what year an El Nino is going to occur. So maybe in a hundred years the model will get it right and there'll be an El Nino, you know, every seven years or, or at, the, at the historical rate of El Ninos, but if it's going to, it's not going to occur you know, you can't look at the model and say, oh, the model is predicting an El Nino in 2060. You can't expect that to happen. So you would see where I'm trying to get at. So, you know, we're getting the overall trend, but the timing of these types of swiggles is not right, or we can't expect it to be right. A good example of that is the last several years. Over the last 10 years, we've actually, if you look at a trend, it's been cooling or flat. People will say, oh, climate change is over. Well, no, that, that cooling part is we're in one of these valleys, and eventually we'll come out. So the model is trying to get the overall trend, the gross aspects of things. It can't be expected to get every week. Okay, models are gridded. Basically, the whole globe is divided into a number of grid boxes. 
kind of on, you know, resolution changes with time. Pretty much state of the art now is maybe 100 kilometers on the side, a degree by a degree maybe is a, is a good size global circulation model. Grid boxes go up into the atmosphere, grid boxes go down into the ocean. But the idea is, you know, each of these grid boxes is a node in the model. So there's one value for each of these grid boxes. One value for temperature, one value for elevation, you name it. All of the models, and there are a number of different climate models out there. Any number of climate groups has their own model. But yet, all of these models share pretty much a common set of core physical equations. Okay? They need to conserve momentum. They need to serve, a, in a special case, momentum in the vertical through the hydrostatic equation. They need to conserve mass. They need to conserve energy. And the equation of state needs to apply to the atmosphere. So at the crux of all these models, this is it. These are, you know, these are the core equations. And we won't go into those too much. But really where the art comes into state of the art in climate model is through how things are parameterized. How do we take care of things that occur at, grids, at, at a scale that is smaller than the grid scale of the model? So here a good example, and maybe not a good example, I couldn't get a good picture here, is, is clouds. Okay? You know, where clouds really matter is at the scale of the individual drops. If I look at a cloud, or you, know, you sit in on my cloud physics class, but whether a cloud is going to reflect solar radiation, or allow solar radiation to pass through, or absorb long wave radiation, really depends on what are the sizes of the drops. And the sizes of the drops are like nanometers, okay? We're small scale here. And uh, basically, what is the density of those drops? So these are things that are on many orders of magnitude smaller scale that the model is able to, to take into account. Keep in mind, we have about a degree by a degree box, and we have to say it's cloudy or it's not cloudy, okay? So those types of things need to be parameterized into the model. And again, kind of simple things. If the relative humidity in the model over the grid box reaches a certain level, it's cloudy. Or this cloud has this albedo in it based on that. So there are a number of ways to do it. And that's how one model may differ from another. So that's why my answer might come out to be different than somebody else's. So we have a, a, a spread of solutions going into the future, mainly due to how these are parameterized. Um, and again, there's been a whole evolution through time, not only this, these FAR, SAR, TAR are the IPCC reports, so that's the first assessment report, the second, um, the fourth, finally, I guess they needed to do something because the fourth and the fifth were both going to be far. But anyway, you can see the size of the grid boxes are going from about, a, about 500 kilometers on the side in the first assessment report to about 100 kilometers on the side now. The way things are parameterized in the models has changed dramatically. You know, in the 70s, there were no clouds. You know, if there was enough water in the atmosphere, it rained out, and that was it. No clouds. Um, you know, even here in the 70s, there was no ocean. There was just a lot of water, and water was allowed to evaporate, but there was no current. There was no deep circulation in the ocean. All the ocean was was a source of water vapor for the atmosphere. And then finally, as we get into the recent period of time, I mean, we got a really sophisticated model. We have an ocean with a circulation, deep circulation, surface circulation, Atmospheric chemistry is starting to be modeled. The vegetation at the surface starts to interact and is dynamic, not just static through time. So a whole evolution in how these models have, have come about. And primarily, uh, the thing that's, that's going on here is an increase in computing power. Really, uh, right on through this, the models have been pushing the available computer power. All right, so kind of going back to how well my models are doing, if you remember the observations, and these are the global observations, we have this period of time from 1900 to 1920 where the temperature rises, a cooling in through the 40s, through the 70s, and then a rise again. So it has kind of this kind of uh, zigzag pattern. Let's see what happens when we try to model it. Okay, so one of the nice things about a climate model is we can play games with the climate model. We can, we can in some ways play God. We can add greenhouse gases. We can take away greenhouse gases. We can make volcanoes erupt. We can not make volcanoes erupt. We can make the sun brighter. We can make the sun dimmer. We can do all of these things and see how that impacts what the output of the model is. So here's an example, again, of my zigzag of temperature and a climate model that is run with the only change through this period of time is the change 
in the greenhouse gases. So the greenhouse gases in the model are changed according to what has been observed. And as we can see, this red line is the model. Um, it really doesn't match very well with the observed pattern that I have. And through here, yeah, you know, the trend is about right. They're offset. Misses is cooling totally and not really getting this <coughs> right over here. Not a good match. Do the same thing. In this case, keep the greenhouse gases constant. And the only thing changed in the model is the change in the natural forces. And here, basically, volcanic eruptions and changes in the solar intensity. And if we look at that, well, if you notice the model here, um, again, in the red, kind of matches a little bit better here. Starts to match a little bit better here. And then we have this rise. And then finally, we put it all together. Okay? Have the observations in black and kind of my general trends in blue, the model in red. And we see that the model, at least in my, in my view, matches the observations fairly well. We're able to capture this warming in the early part of the record. That probably is, has nothing to do or very little to do with greenhouse gases, but has everything to do with the sun being brighter and there being a, a lack of volcanic eruptions. We get this cooling fairly well in through here, 50s. What's going on there? Sulfate aerosols, okay? burning dirty coal, acid rain. Okay? Basically, the aer aerosols that we emit when we burn coal are reflective. So they reduce the amount of incoming solar radiation. And actually, on this global scale, we have a cooling. And then as we get into the 70s, this is the, the large increase in greenhouse gases, very little to do with natural variations in this period of time. And also at a time when we've been cleaning up the coal, so the sulfate aerosols are becoming less and less and less in most parts of the world, not all parts of the world. So again, my example here of a climate, of climate model doing a pretty good job of, of matching the observations really throughout this whole 100 plus year period of time. Okay. And then finally, how do we get these big, large-scale grid boxes to come down to a local level? How do we say, OK, this box here that's the size of New York, or almost the size of New York, that has one temperature value, one everything, how do we start to make some inferences on how climate change will impact, say, the wine industry, perhaps, water resources in the New York City watershed? Things that happen on a small scale. We don't care about what's going on globally or even New York size. We need to bring these data down to, um, down to a different level. And just as an example of what I mean, uh, this is the United States. And this is the elevation of the United States as seen by a climate model. So you do see the Rocky Mountains here in kind of the white, but they're mo no more than a little hump, a little bump on the map. But if we go down to the scale we really need, you know, we want the mountains to look like that. That's the thing that's driving the snowpack in the west and, and water resources in the west, not this little hump in the map. Okay? So these types of features start to become very, very important when we want to look at local scale impacts or even regional scale impacts. So the way we get from one to another is through a process that's called downscale. And really here it's an idea of resolving the mismatch of the scales. Um, show some examples. It can be done statistically or it can be done dynamically. So basically using a finer scale model to do the downscale. Um, both of these have their origins in weather prediction. In the current state of the art is one is no better than the other. They both have their pros and cons. And in the end, um, either one of these is an acceptable method. We've been doing a lot of work recently in the climate project that Dave and Jonathan have been involved with and, and us over in Bradfield, really looking at statistical downscaling. But uh, we've been doing some dynamical downscaling too for things like lake effect snow that kind of lends itself to that application. Uh, just to give you an idea of how this works in weather forecasting. Okay? This is the results from last week of the EAS weather forecasting contest. And a bunch of these are students, but basically what I wanted to show is the best forecast here is basically through a statistical downscaling table. Okay? So it's a totally statistical forecast. This has no, no person is involved. Okay? It comes right off the computer. And that's actually doing quite well. It's beating me. Okay? 
Um, and that's a consensus. So this is a number of these different statistical approaches. Here's a particular st statistical approach. And again, it's doing fairly well. Um, Brian is our computer guru, and he runs the dynamical model. Basically takes the forecast right from the model. Again, the model is doing well. So this idea of downscaling from a model to the game farm or weather station, you know, it's, it's, we see it in action in weather forecasts. And my argument here is either I'm doing pretty poorly or it does, it, it's doing pretty well in this case for the semester. Notice where Waisaki is, if anybody knows Mark. <laughs> Who's your humanoid? Uh, one, of the, one of the undergrads. So. Um, anyway, um, you know, so if we look at statistical downscaling first, really the biggest pro is it's computationally inexpensive. It's easy to do, or relatively. Um, we can tailor it uh, to specific variables. We can look at some exotic things, things that aren't even in the climate models. Storm surges, air quality perhaps, um, can be made site specific. But the downsides is, you know, the biggest downside perhaps um, is it's not describing the physical process. So we're making a big leap of faith that whatever we're basing our statistics on isn't changing in the future. Right? So we're saying, okay, whatever the relationship we're looking at today or basing our model on today is going to hold in the future. And that may or may not be a good assumption. The simplest way to do this is just to say, okay, I use this in Providence. Basically, if I want to look at Providence annual precip, and I look at the GCM grid that encompasses um, Providence, and I strike a regression, and it's not a one-to-one -one relationship if it were perfect, but it's somewhere off of the one-to-one -one line. And I can use that as my downside. Not very, not very, I uh, don't want to say too much about that. Still a way to do it. Um, looking in some of the more common ways that are doing this, in the New York assessment, again, that Dave and Jonathan and some others in the room have been involved with, they use what's called a delta method. And basically here we have an observed distribution of temperature. In this case, our observed period is from 70 to 2,000. And we have what the model says is the observed distribution of temperature for that particular point in the same period of time. And they don't match up. Okay. And then we have what the model is saying the temperature is at some point in time in the future. And the delta becomes the model present minus the model future, so this blue area. And then that delta is applied back to the data. So in other words, here are my daily observations from, say, of temperature from, say, Rochester from 1970. And to each day, all I do is add this delta. So if this delta were 5 degrees, each observation here gets inflated by 5 degrees. Again, a fairly simple method of doing it. The biggest drawback in my mind is the variability of the climate never changes. If it was cold on this day, relatively cold on this day in 1970. It's going to be relatively cold on that day in, in the future model, just five degrees warmer. So the same progression of temperature changes, stays. Um, it just gets translated upward. Um, some more sophisticated methods actually look at the whole distribution of temperature. and allows delta to change, not, defines delta not just at the median or the average, but across the whole distribution. So this would be my example here of perhaps in the green, an observed, here we have a cumulative distribution function on percentage of observations here in green, and how does the delta change at each of these nodes, and maybe the model is cooler at the very low end, and maybe it's higher at the very high end, and maybe there's a large difference in the middle. So each of these are taken into account, and therefore we can start to adjust days differently depending on how hot or cold they are. I'm going to skip the next one. Um, another way to do this is to look at a greater suite of predictors. To use all this information that the climate models give us. Things like, you know, what is the 500 millibar height? You know, think of a weather map. Uh, how, what are the winds doing along? So use all this whole, you know, if you think of, if I asked you, um, you know, if I told you from the model, it was going to be cloudy today, and there was going to be a trough over New York. You know, would you say, even basic weather, would you say it's going to be a hot day or a warm day? The 
this. Try that again. A hot day or a cold day. A cool day, right? A trough is generally cool, clouds, we don't have any sun. So that type of broad scale information kind of gets some, some information. So where do I want to go with that? Here's an example of downscaling using this for snowpack. Okay, so this is some work that we've done where lots of lines here, probably not the best graph to show on the screen. The black line is the historical snow depth at uh, Wanakina Ranger Station in the Adirondacks. Okay. The blue line is basically a climate model that we have downscaled to that particular location. So I would argue that in my blue line, we're doing pretty good in getting the maximum average snow depth. This is over a period of time. So in any average year, you would expect there to be at least 20 inches of snow on the ground pretty much getting the timing fairly good in the beginning and the end. We're, we're losing our snowpack at least at a similar rate. Our timing's off by a few, by about a week or two. But we, we, we basically replicate this fairly well in the downscale. The purple, the mustard, and the red are the model run on this station through into the future. So we've downscaled the data from the GCM for the 20s, the 50s, and the 80s. You see in the in the 20s, the purple line, we reduce our snowpack a little bit, not much, and we kind of shorten our snow season a bit there. But it's really not until the 50s and the 80s that we really see dramatic increases in the snow depth of this station based on this downscaling thing. Basically going from on average 20 inches to on average about 4 inches of snow at this Adirondack location. Also notice not too much change in what's going on at the beginning of the season start to accumulate snow, but a dramatic change at the end of the season for when we lose the snowpack, basically from mid-May mid to actually early April in, in when the snowpack comes out. So again, a technique that can be used um, for downscaling. Okay, dynamical downscaling, we're using basically a model in a model, so it's keeping the physics, but it's very computationally expensive. So as an example, um, if I wanted to focus in on the U.S., what I would do is have a small area just over the U.S. the globe, kind of cut it out like a patchwork quilt. And basically, the world is going to end at these boundaries. But at each of the boundaries, what's going to be fed in are conditions from the global circulation model. So those global grids basically are feeding what's going on in this, in this inner model. And in this inner model, we can start to get the resolution down to the things that might resolve the Adirondacks and the lakes and things along those lines. And as an example, um, kind of is showing a number of different approaches. This is uh, obviously the Northeast. Uh, these are data out of the Northeast Climate Impacts Assessment by Heho et al. And the et al. is Dave Wolf, and I was involved with that. And a number of other people at Cornell. So this is a report that preceded the climate report. And we're looking at uh, precipitation here, I believe, in this graphic. And in, in panel E, these are the stations. And basically, the, the blues are showing different levels of precipitation um, given by the scale. H, on the other hand, R is the precipitation from a global circulation model. So that's why we have these big patches, each of these boxes is one of the grids from the model. The F is if we downscale this with a dynamical model. Okay? So feed this information into a finer scale model. You can get an idea of what the grid size is from these boxes. And you can see we start to pick up more of the detail. You can see the Adirondacks and their effect toward higher precipitation. You can see some of that down in the Catskills as well. You can see some of the mountains or graphic precipitation coming out from New England. And then finally, in this panel here, this is a statistically downscaled simulation of the same data. So all of these are showing the same thing. Stations, global model, dynamically downscaled, statistically downscaled. And here, uh, this is downscaled to about an eighth of a degree resolution, better than this. And again, kind of picking up the Adirondacks, uh, Catskills, actually our highest rainfall in New York. Um, is, is right around here in the New York City watershed that comes out very nicely um, up and down the mountains of, of, of Vermont. And I think I will open it up for some questions here. In, in the last slide that you had, um, so in G, it looks like Connecticut gets
gets a lot more rain, um, but but it doesn't, you know, in, in the large model in H and then in the other one in F. So why, you know, it, it seems like it's fairly consistent with New York, but all of a sudden Connecticut but not in, in New Jersey, you know, and so that's just uh, aspect of the, the model, I guess. Again, aspect of the model, um, basically probably some coastal influences there. If you actually look. If we actually looked at the observations as, spar as sparse as they are, um, you know, basically you have this large area. Connecticut and the observations look a lot like most of New York, except except the, the high peaks of the Adirondacks. So in this case, this statistical method does make a little bit more sense that way rather than this. Okay. Keeping in mind, I'm cheating a little bit there because these observations are driving the statistics. They're not driving the dynamical model. Um, and again, an example of this being used in real time, I mean, if, if you watch, again, going, going from climate to weather, if, if, if you watch any of the local weather, you know, weather casts on TV where they kind of have their own, they basically are running their own mini model, especially now that it's getting to be lake effect season. You know, a big national forecast model is not going to get the lake effect. But these smaller models that can resolve the lake and can resolve the temperatures of the lake will get that. So that's what's being used on this small scale, both by the TV meteorologists and actually the weather service offices around New York. So that, that type of information is there. In, in none of the global circulation models is are the Great Lakes included. Or I take that back, one or two. So if we're looking at something like Great Lakes, that is just something that is falling through the cracks in these models. And then even as we get down to the smaller scale, if we're looking at things like what might be going on in the Finger Lakes, it's in most of the finest scale models, they're, you know, the Finger Lakes themselves are one grid box. So it's really tough even there to look at that type of an effect. So we really have a scale effect in going here. Now if we wanted to look at what's going to be going on right in the lakes, um, you know, we have to basically take the models that are out there and, and actually increase their resolution to, to get the lakes because the lakes are just, just just too small to be resolved. If they were a little bit bigger, they would be nicely in there, but in, in their current size doesn't match up with the, grid, the gridding in these models. Chris, go ahead. Steve. Yeah, just, I'm not sure how to ask this, actually, but if we go backwards in this, in this process, you're talking about this an amazing increase in computing power needs to do the global climate model, yet most people yeah, okay, that's interesting, but I want to know what, with 100% certainty, what the weather is going to be a week from today, because I've got a wedding to go to with that. Right. So is the computing power that we're getting for the global climate model uh, filtering down to these more local and shorter term situations? It, 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 it is to a certain degree, but I mean, the bad news is you're never going to get 100% accuracy because it's just... The, the chaos in the system, no matter you have as much computing power as you want, but the solutions to the equations that you need to solve and in the real world are in some cases, you know, they have multiple solutions or, you know, you have, you know, the, the idea of a butterfly flapping its wings and you go off in another direction. You're never going to have the observations at a, at a, at a fine enough density to, to resolve all of that to get it. So you get down to a level it's, it's not so much the computing power, but the you know, you need to have the observations to, you know, garbage in, garbage out. If you don't have the observations at the scale that things are happening, you're not going to be able to initialize the model at those scales. And even there, the equations can go awry with a, with a small tweak. Um, where, where what is done both in the weather scale and also the climate scale is using what are called ensembles. So in other words, I can, and that's where the computing power comes in. I can take my initialization of the model and tweak it a little bit to say, I'm not exactly sure what the state of the atmosphere looks like right now. So I'm going to say, oh, it could look like this, it could look like that, it could look like something else. And in each of those cases, I'm going to use that as an initial condition to my model. And then as I model it into the future, the idea is if you know the initial state makes a big difference, the models are going to diverge. And then I can say, Chris, flip a coin for your wedding. But if the if the if the divergence, you know, if the models are close together, that gives you some increase in certainty in your forecast. So I mean, a lot. I know I see Marty in the back. A lot of times when 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 we do the turf call, you know, I'll say I don't have any confidence in what's going to happen a week from now. And then some weeks I say, yeah, it looks pretty good. It's going to be hot. It's going to be dry. 
and, and kind of what we're looking at there is, you know, are, are these ensembles going off in different directions or are they all converging on the same solution? You do the same thing with a climate model. And there you can not so much tweak the initial conditions, but one, what's done there is really the thing that's driving the differences there are how the models are parameterized. So are clouds going to make a big difference? And is this guy doing the clouds better than somebody else? So an ensemble of climate models tends to be basically just different models or slightly different models to see how that progresses out. So, you know, you never see, you're never going to see in 2100 that this is what the temperature is going to be. It's going to be a range of temperatures to give you an idea of that certainty. Ken, you have a question? Yeah, with respect to the duration of the snowpack, particularly at high, higher latitudes, do the models take into consideration albedo changes? Um, yes and no. Um, I guess I'll, I'll ask you a question. Which models are we talking about? <laughs> so at, <laughs> at, the global, at the global scale, yes. Um, and these dynamical models, yes. So if, you know, in a dynamical model, if it's, you know, even if we're at a small one kilometer, two kilometer grid, if it's snowing more, um, yes. I mean, that is clearly one of the main things that will be driving those models is what is the albedo, and that will be related to the snowpack. There's when we get into a statistical model, you know, there is no, there isn't that give and take there in that case. It's basically, at, at the large scale, this is what it's predicting, and albedo is, you know, part of that, um, and it goes from there. Does that answer the question? Yeah, more or less. Uh, with respect to, you know, discussions about afforestation on a large global scale, um, apparently albedo is, is one consideration. Sure. To um, counteract. Right, and that's, I mean... Yes, that's clearly something that's that's used in the models. I mean, actually, we do in my climate change class. We read a paper where they af they they afforestate a large part of Canada, and the idea is that well, that should draw down CO two, and it should be a good thing for climate change. But in the end, what it does is you're taking, you know, they're doing this on the prairies that are normally snow covered in the winter. So what you're doing is taking away the snow cover and putting coniferous forest, which has is absorbing a lot of radiation. So Basically, the radiation effect, absorbing that radiation, equals the same amount of warming that you get, you know, by removing the greenhouse. So it's a balance in the end um, due to that. So, you know, that is one of the neat things about the models that you can you can do those exercises and, and, and do those thought experiments. Um, you know, clearly, when the models are run for these big IPCC reports, uh, the runs take years to run. So the runs for the current the next IPCC report are actually being ginned up now. A lot of the runs for these IC, the next round of IPCC reports will be done at, in not the entire globe, but in a large portion of the globe at a very fine resolution. It will almost be like not dynamically downscaling, but actually running the global models at select locations at a very, very fine scale, the US being one of them. So it's going to be a very different, you know, as the models increase, we'll see a very different flavor to the kind of IPCC reports that will come out in the, in the future. It'll be much more down to the local or regional level than, than global. Um, um, you, you showed us why uh, you can make much better predictions on the climate than on the weather forecast. But when you start downscaling, as you described, do you introduce a lot of noise in that manner so that predictions you're making for, let's say, Ithaca versus Syracuse become almost the same kind of noise as your weather forecasting noise? <clears throat> yes and no. I mean, <laughs> what I want to say is where it doesn't become the noise is if you're representing a key process if you're, dy if you're dynamically downscaling, okay, and, and let's use the lakes as an example. So let's say I care about lake, how lake effect snow is going to change, or even in a forecast, I care about whether there's going to be lake effect snow. The fact that I'm putting those lakes in there and allowing, you know, physically modeling that process, um, I'm getting a lot of signal there. Um, if we're going, if we're taking the lakes out and just saying, okay, how is the temperature going to vary between maybe not. Uh, I'll not pick on Syracuse, Ithaca and Binghamton, so to speak. 
So there, really, it's just noise. There's not a big driving physical mechanism that would make that change like would be in lake effect. My answer is going to be yes. That makes sense? Yeah. Yes. This is a real local application question. Okay. Where does the Ithaca Journal get its information on weather? <laughs> uh, I believe their forecasts come from a private forecasting company in State College, Pennsylvania. They don't get it from you? They don't get it from us. No. Um, we, a long time ago, we used to, I mean, same type of thing when I was at Rutgers many moons ago, the meteorology department there used to forecast from a local paper, but as the media markets have gotten more uh, global and national and big companies, it's all going for these companies. So there is no, the only thing that might come, that does come in the Ithaca Journal is the observations from the road, they scrape them off of our website. Yep, that's unfortunate. <laughs> You want a good fork, call the Cornell weather phone and get the, get the... Where do you call right. it? What's the number? Yes. I'm embarrassed to say I don't know off the top of my head. <laughs> <laughs> That's what's on the U portal too, isn't it? Yeah, it's on the U portal too. Yeah. yeah. So what? On, on the Cornell site. Okay. Yeah. All right. I think we got a question. A question from Geneva. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, I've uh, heard cases where there's uh, suggestions that the night temperatures will warm more than day temperatures in the future. Uh, can you talk about about that? Is that is that always going to be the case, or you know, what? What's the basis of that? Um, that is definitely true in the observations. Any of the models do show a warming of of nighttime temperatures relative to daytime temperatures. Um, you know, it's not what it is not is the fact, you know, we're always radiating energy. So it's not the fact that, you know, at nighttime we're not getting any sunlight, so we're just radiating energy. Um, really there, it is a combination. Most of the, the change in nighttime temperature, I believe, has to do actually with more land use change and things like that, where, um, you know, urbanization and, 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 and things along those lines, even just buildings and things like that, have a higher heat capacity. So the, the heat is being stored more at the day and then being given off at night. Did that answer your question, Alan? Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Thank you. So tomorrow's the election, and uh, <laughs> I've heard quite a few uh, Republican politicians the last couple of weeks saying that this whole thing is just a liberal hoax to, you know, get more uh, votes or do, do you do you think the modeling will ever reach a level or there there is some number of data points or some margin of error that we will get to that will convince skeptics that, that this is really happening no <laughs> i mean and i'm not saying that uh, i am a climatologist uh, the reason that i'm saying that is there'll always be uncertainty I mean, there always is. And um, I think it's not an issue of whether the science is correct or accurate or not. Um, in, my, in, in my opinion, it's, it's an issue of what do we have to do to correct the problem. And, and the solution to the problem is not appealing. Um, it will require drastic changes in the way we do business and operate society and things like that. And, and that's the thing that, in my mind, drives the politics and, and the sides of where it becomes tough is, you know, it is hard to say. And if you, you know, if I'm along the coast and I'm New York City and I'm pretty darn, you know, there, you know, sea level rise, you got the, the error bars there are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. You have a big problem. It's a lot of money. You know, I, I need to solve that problem. If I'm here in upstate New York, talking to Neil in Minnesota, you know, maybe a few degrees of warming, you know, there's opportunities. So there's going to be winners and losers. So you have that that part of thing too. But if we're looking collectively as a globe, um, clearly the problem is there. The solution to the problem of global warming is, in my mind, also the solution to a lot of the other world's problems. And you know that whole thing should be packaged together and coming up with a solution. So does that tell you how I'm voting tomorrow? <laughs> Perhaps we should end it there. <laughs> Let's thank Art again for this. This has been a production of Cornell University. 
on the web at cornell.edu.